So today, we'll start where we used to start in the previous two occasions. And uh, we talk about the five desires. And everyone knows what they are here. Is the normal or excessive human desire for money, fame, sex, food, and sleep. All together. We talked about the fact that these are the five basic forces, besides other smaller forces, that keep human society together. As long as human society exists, we do not seem to live without them. But how we relate to them, how we handle them, defines how we live our lives. So, we talked about the chemistry or the addictive nature of the five desires and that's why the Buddha and subsequent teachers, they point out the danger of being attached to them. But what other consequences are there if we don't recognize the true nature of these desires? Well, one thing is that we do not just become attached to them, we identify with them. And as we identify with them, we become very, very possessive. So it's not just, I am famous, but famous people believe that they control or possess those people who pay attention to them. In a relationship, if it becomes sensual, then people really have the sense of mutual possession. Or if people get a lot of money, then they are not only attached to the money, but they also believe they control that, they possess that, so it's okay for them to put it into a bank and have it ticking on some interest. Sleep and food are pretty much self-evident here. You buy some food, you want to eat it, so you possess it. Sleep is the same. I have my place, I have my little opportunity to rest. It's my quiet time, it's my sleeping opportunity. What's wrong with possessive behavior, if any? Well, first of all, it can become a habit and you cannot easily give it up. There's a story about a Nepalese Rinpoche who used to practice very hard and they had a pilgrimage. And they were somewhere in Kathmandu or Pokhara in some of the bigger cities with a lot of his students. And he wasn't a poor Rinpoche, he got a lot of donations, but he wore very used clothes, like patched robes in Korea. And there was a professional beggar on the square. And you know professional beggars, they are supremely good actors. <laughs> so they really can totally and absolutely make you believe that they are the most destitute, poor, and wretched persons on earth, and if you, personally, do not help them right away, they die. On the spot of starvation, desolation, lack of human compassion, or just simply food. So this professional beggar had this begging bowl. He was going around, doing his act, you know, very slowly. I mean, if you're a beggar, you're not so healthy and dynamic, you know. And some of these beggars are really real, but I'm talking about the professional beggar right now. And as professional beggars know, you already have to have some little thing in your begging bowl, not completely empty, because that little thing will attract the bigger thing, right? So, he was going really around and everybody was watching what the Rinpoche was going to do. And the beggar, of course, he didn't have money or any kind of you know, valuables in there. It's not customary. If you're a professional beggar, you beg for food. I mean, that's what you need, right? So he had something like a beginning of a Kong Yang in the bowl and his professional beggar attitude. And this Rinpoche went over, looked at the beggar, and suddenly got that thing out of the bowl and ate it. And looked at the totally stunned face of the beggar and said, how can this happen to me? It's my food. I got it. I am the beggar. Okay? So that was a totally big shock for him and also for the retinue that this slimy something which was in the middle of the ball, who knows how long, the Rinpoche just snapped it up, ate it, and looked straight into the face of the beggar 
Now what you're doing? Now what you're doing? What's the reaction? Because it's totally opposite of the normal thing. It's a pious behavior. I have more money, more affluence, more food than you. So I put it here and I feel very good about myself and you feel good about me. This didn't happen. Rinpoche was teaching the professional beggar that he can give something. He also has something. You know, it's easier to believe that Wall Street people with millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars in, the, in their chest, in their bank account, they have something to give. In fact, they're not different from this beggar who believed that this little piece of food is mine, and mine only. Possessive behavior doesn't depend on the amount of money you have or the amount of food you have. It's a general human behavior. The richest man in the world in the 80s, before Bill Gates got so rich, was a Japanese real estate, you know, magnate. And he lived in a house, in, in fact, not in a house, in an apartment, which you can see all around here. It's 15, 20, sometimes 30-story apartments. If you go to Pusan, even 50 stories. The tallest I've seen was there. I didn't count, but it, it took me a minute, you know, just to walk in. Oh, my God. So... He lived in an apartment like that, and he really had billions and tens of billions of dollars, and no one would know. He dressed like you or me. He didn't make an identity out of his being rich. I'm not sure about the charity work that he'd done. And, uh, you know, sometimes famous people are notoriously late. I mean, not just a little bit. Hours late. You know why? Because they believe they can make people wait. In Hungary, there is a saying, being late is the politeness of kings and queens. Maybe you have something similar in Korea. But the point of the matter is that they control your attention, so they control your presence, they possess your time and space by being famous, so they can afford to be late. It's not just impolite, it's very rude, extremely rude. So... Why is possessive behavior generally a problem? Human society, as we see it, depending on the culture where you are, trains you to be more possessive or less possessive relative to one another. When you go to the West, society is more individualistic, people are used to having a lot more space and objects and money for themselves, whereas in the East they share more. I mean, I was stunned when I heard that, you know, I knew three sisters and only one of them had a full-time job. The other finished university and didn't have a job. And the third one had a sometimes appearing, sometimes disappearing, like an Arbeit. Sometimes appear, sometimes disappear, that kind of job. And I said to the eldest who was working full-time, said, you guys are living together, but the expenses are pretty much the same but the income that you bring in is very different so how do you balance that out she says we don't consider it such a big deal now i'm working and she doesn't have a job when she has a job i'll be studying at university and then she takes care of me and then if the arbeit doing or the part-time you know worker sister gets a full-time job she'll pitch that in too in America, this wouldn't stand even for a week, unless you're sick, incapacitated, or have some really strong reason not to earn money, they will not let this happen. Even if you are the closest blood relative or the family member, I mean brother, sister, husband, wife, same thing. Very serious. Everybody has to make money in the West. Every single one of them, one by one. You know? And there is sharing in the family, of course. You're grown as a, as a child, you're getting taken care of. But sooner than later, then you are expected to contribute, also financially. So this kind of possessive behavior is trained. And you're trained that this is mine, and that's yours, and yours, and yours. So you learn the difference between individuals by possessive behavior. But... If you want to go beyond the self, if you want to go beyond the five desires, if you want to go beyond appearance and disappearance, then possessive behavior is working against you. 
So no wonder that some great teacher said, give all your possessions to the poor and follow me. You know who he was. You know. Jesus himself said that. And he was teaching this not because he was running a charity organization. He knew that possessive behavior is working against awakening or salvation or redemption, whatever you call your deliverance from desire, anger and ignorance. So it works against you if you want to transcend it because it binds you down. I love to use the Lord of the Rings as an example and parable, an analog to the spiritual path. And the ring that has to be cast into Mount Doom, into the Mount of Fire, where it came from, is the ring of power, personal power over everything and everyone. So that's the power of I. It's a possessive thing. And if you cast your own possessive instinct into the fire where it came from, and you reach extinction, then you are free. And that's why Frodo, the ring bearer, can take the ship. And at the end of the book, he can go to the pure land. He can go to the place where there's no life, no death. Absolutely. Guknak sege or tushita. And then you understand through this very long and very wonderful book what it means, how enormously exhausting it is to put down your I and to put down your possessive instinct. So, does this mean that after this Dharma talk we start throwing, you know, Manwon and Omanon, you know, into the air? No, we don't. Nobody will do that. And that's right that we don't do that. What we need to change is our behavior, our attitude, our openness to people. Why? If you help, what do you help? If you become open, to what do you become open? If you choose a path, where does that path lead? Becoming less possessive doesn't mean that you should become stupid. Never. If you progress on the path, your wisdom and compassion will direct your energy, that is also your material, not just mental energy, to the right direction. So that means you give where you see that it serves a good purpose. What is a good purpose? A good purpose can be serving other people's awakening or reducing people's suffering on this earth. They are not necessarily the same. Charity organizations, they reduce human beings' suffering, but they're not directed towards awakening. Temples or spiritual organizations may not do direct charity work. Some do, some don't. But what they do is that they work for the mental awakening of humankind to preclude or prevent the causes of suffering. So you can treat this at the root level, where suffering is born, and you can treat this at the result level, where suffering is, India, Africa, you name it, South America, wherever it is. So, this material power or money is very tricky. If you do the wrong thing with it, it does very weird things. And the current problem of the world is that fake money or money based on ideas and the real money that you are working for, that represents human energy, they are mixed up. And when fake money is mixed up with real money, then it's like mixing sand with rice. You can't eat it. That's why financial transactions these days in the world are so risky. Because there's a hypothetical value of money. Look at banks and investment firms and portfolio equity businesses, what they do. They create financial ideas. And they have these letters for it, like CDS, CFO, you know, debt equity, swap, all kinds of stuff. So they create financial ideas and they use your money to make money on this. But if they lose, then they lose your money, your energy, your savings. It's happening. You already understand that. The last big meltdown was 2008, 
and the next one is coming. You don't have to be a prophet or a special financial doomsday sayer to see it. It's up in the air. It's on the charts, it's on the stock exchange, it's everywhere. So what can you do? Well, we can say don't depend on money, but all of us do. So as long as we depend on money to a certain extent, what is it that we can trust more than that? And I don't want to sound too didactic or romantic, but I can only say that we can trust each other more than we can trust money. That's all we've got. Like the three sisters, they didn't you know, depend on money, they depended on each other, and sometimes one made money, sometimes the other. This is really important. There may be a time when the value of this printed paper will be close to nothing. Then there will be another invention to exchange value. So as long as we have human society, we have possessive behavior. Material possession needs conversion so that I can sell this and buy this if I want to. The means of conversion is money. But it got redefined and sometimes corrupted over time so much due to the excessive possessive behavior that ideas or illusions got mixed with reality. I give you an example. I have an apple, okay? Suppose this is an apple. I give this to her because she needs it for a day. She borrows money for a day, uses it, and at the end of the day, she pays it back because she has this. This is the collateral. If she doesn't pay, then the bank or the lender takes this from her and says, we're sorry, we take your collateral. But of course, Crystal also needs this, and then Bojognim also needs this, and then Kwanjanim also needs this, so it goes around, one, two, three, four, five, and comes back to me. I'm not the lender, I'm part of the real world, and uh, I'm also in need of this. So for each one of us, one, two, three, four, five, six, have it for a day. Include yourself, okay? I can't count to 40 or something. All of you have this for a day and can use it and then give it over. But we realize we need to make this a little faster. So everybody can have it for one hour. One hour, and for that one hour you can use it, borrow money, use the money, make some profit, and return the money and then hand this over to the other person. But then we realize, no, 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 one hour is still too long. She has to wait too long. He has to wait too long. So let's make it one minute. So for one minute, then it becomes very fast. Very fast, fast, quickly, come, go, money, come, go, possession, come, go. Then we say, no, 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 we want to make more profit. We want to have it even faster. So 10 seconds, only 10 seconds, becomes now 600 times faster than before. Then one second. One second. Every second this changes hands. And then we say, we want to be even more professional, more efficient, and more profit-oriented, so we say five times a second. Then ten times a second. Twenty times a second. And when it reaches twenty-four times a second, then it seems that everybody has an apple in their hands. It's called the permanent illusion. So 24 frames a second, 24 exchanges a second, means that everybody seems to have an apple permanently in their hands. And then you borrow, as if it was permanent. You borrow it for a day, for a week, for a month, for a year, because illusion is so fast that you believe that it's real. And then one day, I'm the bad guy. One day I say, originally, this is mine. I take it away. Because I need to eat this apple right now. And when I've done that, all of you are without an apple, all of your loans default, everything collapses. That's how possessive behavior works. That's why we have to wake up from this. That's why we have to separate illusion from reality. And like I've said, there's nothing wrong with money, but fake money kills real money. Illusions can kill reality, not just in the financial realm, also in human relationships. Projections kill real intimacy and love. 
So this, Yorobun, all of us, is our human job. Wake up. So then the five desires can turn into the five medicine, but only one way. That's why the title says, originally one medicine. Awakened mind is the medicine which turns the five poisons to the five expedient means. And what makes the difference is the non-possessive or non-selfish behavior. You know? In the 60s, there was the gold standard. Then Nixon abolished the gold standard because they said it doesn't provide for a growth which would be fast enough for the US and the Western economy. So they abolished the gold standard and they started to have other collaterals which backed up money. Industry, service, like the GDP, the, like the output of a country. And that's what defined the value of your... So your, your country was very industrious and produced a lot of wealth and a lot of goods and a lot of export, then mo money was very high, very strong. You didn't work so hard, not so much output, started to go low. But then the idea of service started to change. And then these financial instruments came and many, many laws were abolished that were safeguarding your money and prevent that risk or investment capital would enter the savings and commercial loans market. So they pulled out all the stops, but instead of a, a steady and quick growth, it became a dance macabre, which is the dance of death. This dance of death I just demonstrated earlier with the Apple example. So we have to slow down, we have to see clearly and we have to make our direction very clear. Why we are here on this earth? Why we are living together? What is the meaning of I and us and the rest of the world? If we don't do that, we not only bleed ourselves financially, we also cannot use whatever resources we have left on this earth. Then the five desires really become poisonous. And before we know it, human beings will start to kill each other for water, food, and other resources. All of this because of I have, and I want to have, and I want to have forever. So I want to close the introductory, before I take your questions, with a poem by Zen Master Sung San. Coming empty-handed, going empty-handed, that is human. When you were born, where did you come from? When you die, where do you go? Life is like a floating cloud which appears. Death is like a floating cloud which disappears. Originally, the floating cloud does not exist. Life and death, coming and going, are also like that. But there's something which remains clear, free from life and death. Tell me, what is this one pure and clear thing? So that was the intro. And now I would like to welcome your questions. Too stunned. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's the way it works. But you don't have to connect to what I spoke about. You just observe what comes up in your mind and you can ask from yourself, by yourself, whatever you have. Don't wait for the tea time. <laughs> You believe during tea time you'll have a better chance? No. I will only stuff myself with the spaghetti that uh, John Suki Bosalim is, is bringing to, today, and salad, and talk, and I'll be totally silent. Yes. So whatever you want to ask, this is the time. Okay. 
Yeah. Can we turn off the fan, please? I'm sorry it will be warm, but we won't hear the questions. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, I have the list. I love her very much. She's only 17 years old. And she's so beautiful, but she doesn't think she's beautiful. And she needs a plastic surgery. <laughs> but I cannot understand her the whole her too much. She's my first niece, but our family is very small. Our family number is not many. So we love her very much, but she always thinks she's not enough. Hmm. She has very low self-esteem. But I cannot understand. Mm, so you said she has very low self-esteem, right? She told me. Okay. She how does she feel about herself? She hates herself? Yes. Does she believe she is ugly? Yes. What makes her think that she is ugly? Did she tell you that? Okay. We don't want to get into private details. But what we really want to see is the mechanism, the mind process, how the concept of beautiful and ugly appear. So she may have pro trouble with her nose, with her eyes, etc., etc. So just like the Buddha had a trip out of the palace, your niece has to take a trip out of her own palace of ugliness and low self-esteem. You can help her do that. Um, take her to several places. I would like you to take her at least to two places. One is a hospice where people are dying. Sometimes in some hospices you are allowed to visit. And if you have any relatives, you know, in any uh, position, in any hospice, I'm sure you can make that happen. Um, there you can see people very close to death. And what happens to your niece that she really doesn't understand change. She believes she will be like this forever. That's why she wants plastic surgery. She doesn't believe that her face will change. So take her to hell a little bit. Where people are dying, it's really tough. I've been to several of these places, including Malaysia, the United States, and uh, one in Korea. It was a hospital. And when you are there, your eyes open up to reality or to existence, life and death on this earth like never before. You must do that for your niece. And then ask her, look at their faces. Are they ugly or beautiful? And then just get this answer out of her. When people are dying, they are just dying. That's all. So next big stage it's a fashion show. <laughs> Take her there. Take her to the extremes that still don't kill her, but make her experience what is human projection of beauty. So then, take her to a fashion show and then see all these seeming beauties walking, you know, on, on stage, back and forth in various types of clothing. And then ask her, you have seen so many of these faces. Which one is the true beauty? Which one of them? Best even if you can catch some of these models and invite them for just a cup of tea and take your niece you know, with you. And then there's an everyday person, not much different from anybody in this room, except that there's no makeup, there's no special way of walking, that there's no special clothing. And then you see an everyday person with a kind of body and skin and everything which is well kept for the job, but it's in no way special. Okay? So that will open your niece's eyes as well. Then the next thing you can do, you know, take her around the market and ask her to look at people's faces as they are shopping. What kind of face they have? Are they beautiful or ugly? So then 
take all these opportunities to open your niece's eyes to take away the notion of self related to beauty and ugly. Because her face is just like that. Her face is not beautiful and not ugly. It's just as she was born. And of course, you, if that kind of clears, the first stage, you know, is going in and your niece accepted some relativity <clears throat> in this world and not the absolute nature of ugly and beautiful, then you can make the next step and ask, what is it that makes your face beautiful in others? In other words, what is beauty that is not your idea, but somebody else or the other people's reflection back to you? What is it that makes them say you are beautiful or you are ugly? What's that? And I'm not going to shoot the answer here. Your, your niece has to find it herself. It's a big, big venture to find out where true beauty comes from, if there is any such thing like that. I remember I had, a, I had some relatives in, in Transylvania and uh, when I was a kid we used to go up there. It's like, it was like going back 40 years in time because it was so underdeveloped and everybody so uh, kind of, we say in Hungarian, stuck to the earth. They just made a living. There was no other way for them to live, just till the land, get some simple job. Very few of them could go to higher education. It's just a Romanian situation. And my grandfather's brother, he lived there. And he had a wife, Lenka Neni. I'll never forget her face. She was 75 years old and shining bright like the full moon because she was happy. Inside, completely happy. And when you look at some of the movie stars without makeup, when their true mind, their true consciousness comes out and it's off stage, it's not some action in a, in a movie, you see their real feelings and those feelings, they paint their face. So their faces actually show what kind of mind they have. And when that happens, then you see whether that mind is beautiful or not, because it comes out right in the face. So. Tell your niece after these experiences not to worry about her outside face, but really clear up her mind. Her mind should be beautiful. Yes. And, if, and if her mind is beautiful, then there's no need for plastic surgery. That will help her. If not, then even plastic surgery will not make any significant change. That's why she has to face others' problems first. Yeah, it's a wrong view. And you and I know it. So that's why you need to help her in a different way. For instance, I'm pretty sure she doesn't have the money for that surgery. She's asking the parents or you to help, right? So there's a hook. I said, yeah, of course, I'll give you the money, but first, let me invite you for a little excursion, you know. Even better, in Anyang, I hope there's still this leprosy village. I was there with a Cambodian monk, it's in Anyang. And they take uh, Kyonggi-do, near Yongin. It's, I think, run by a, a Catholic denomination. And they guard, actually, they take care of people with leprosy there. It's not black leprosy, it's red. So it, it's not contagious. You have to ex be exposed to that for a very, very long time. But still, your things you know, start to fall off after a while because the synapses are gone. You start be, to be numb. There is no energy. There is no blood. So after a while, it's gone. Some of them are this skinny and some of them look very crazy and some of them, and they are all Korean. They all speak the language. They can all tell some story to your niece. So, First prepare yourself, Kami, and then take your sister with you, all right? You're welcome. Next question. <coughs> Any kind of question.
I became a vegetarian from last year because I was feeling very bad with me eating meat. And uh, uh, in my family, my mother and my other families could accept it and understand it for even for uh, just a little bit. But when I'm in being as a social person, uh, sometimes there, there are situations that you know you go out for some samgyeopsal and uh, I'm not eating any meat and people say what, what are you doing? But I could say go ahead and eat your samgyeopsal or just have some ginger chicken but I could say that but um, some, uh, I don't know what I should uh, how should I behave when I, with other people who doesn't understand the things that I felt. I mean, there was one monk who told me that uh, being with others, you should have compassion for others to eat meat too. And he himself eat, ate meat with some other groups at that time. So I do, I did agree to him in certain points, but um, I'm not very clear about it. Thanks for your wonderful question. It awfully reminds me of my earlier problems, you know. Uh, like yourself, I became vegetarian very early in my life, even before meeting Buddhism. And I had to get it accepted with my family. My mother immediately, you know, started to help out and cooked vegetarian dishes, and she keeps doing that to the present day. And uh, my dad could hardly accept that. And he was a doctor and he knew everything what happened in the body, but he was bulgogi, sokogi, you name it. <laughs> All the beef and pork you want, he took it. He says, we have the same kind of teeth as the pig, so you can eat everything. Say, I have the same kind of teeth, dad, but I don't have the same mind. <laughs> <laughs> so for you, there are two questions here that you, ha that you have to answer. The first sounds really selfish, but you have to make it clear for yourself. How far can you go if you really want to eat meat for some reason? I'll tell about these reasons later. So does it really make you sick? Does it make you puke? Does it make you uh, run to the toilet? Does it, does it really produce any adverse? Does it have anything in your skin? or you feel bad in your joints, or whatever. So you have to see what meat actually does to your body and to your mind. Do you become more, more aggressive? Do you sleep longer? Do you have more clouded things? I mean, we react very differently. I remember first six months after I turned vegetarian at age 19, I felt like flying up in the air. My body became so light, my dreams changed, all kinds of stuff for the better. So I said, hey, I mean, we can eat, you know, dairy if we want to. We can have many other products, you know, to supply ourselves from protein. I mean, we are living in tofu country here in Korea. Mm -hmm. So you can do many, many things. But after answering this first question for yourself, you have to ask the second question, which, for better or worse, comes from your culture, which is a group culture which is pushing the individual to conform to group values. And the group value can be sometimes much, much unacceptable for the individual. So what can you do? You can do two things. Either you accept the group value and you say, okay, for this time I'm going to do it with you guys, no problem. Or you have to say, oh my, if, you know, please understand, you know, if I eat meat, I really die. My body becomes so sick, I can't get up for three days and I have bad dreams and I become pig my next lifetime. Oh my gosh, you know. So, you can do many things because you heard from somebody that you should have compassion. It works the other way around too. Maybe the group has to have some compassion too, towards you. Okay? So, you really have to see one thing. Do you want to be accepted in that group 100%? And if yes, how far can you go? Or it's okay not to be accepted in the group, to be a little bit of a black sheep, because even that teaches them. The Buddha was a black sheep, he left. The sixth patriarch was a black sheep, he just left this whole, you know, single mother, you know, behind widowed mother, 
and he went into a monastery. He was black sheep there even then because he couldn't write and he put the poem with the help of another monk on the wall. It was not a conformist behavior. So social conformity is not good, not bad. See the direction, where that conformity goes. And by not following them, you can teach them. Not with an attitude, just by humbly saying, I'm so sorry, it really makes me very, very sick. Because you see that it's not crucial to be accepted there. So you can play with it for a small, small space and short time. You have some space to do that, some game room. But after that, you really have to be honest with yourself and honest with them. In other words, I'm not going out anymore with that group. Or I go out and I completely accept. So it's really important that uh, you keep your correct direction in your mind and conform to those values that you believe in. And if you don't believe in certain values, you will soon leave that group, you know, because they will not trust you. And likewise, you won't trust them. If you guys do this, how would I trust you? You know, if, and they say, if you don't eat meat with us, you're not one of us. F familiar? Happens all the time. So find the group that goes together to Tuenjang Chigen Bab and not to Tang Siyuk, okay? Very easy. But again, be careful. Be careful without an attitude, see reality and see what you can change in the group and change in yourself. Okay? You're welcome. More questions? So get the mic and ask the question. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Uh, since I was born, I just go to church, and in church, uh, I've been told that uh, the poor woman uh, will be blessed if we have, if we don't get uh, our hair cut. I'm sorry. What will be blessed? Uh, if we don't get our hair cut. Yeah. Then. It is even written in the Bible. Yes. I really wonder why. I don't know why. I don't know why we have to have long hair. It's just written so that we uh, just obey. But I, I really wonder why the monk has short hair. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure that this, that this question will help you get enlightenment if I answer it? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that there must be some reasons. Well, I can tell you very kind of clear things about you know, why we cut hair, at least what I know. But why they keep their hair in the Western world, I have very, very little knowledge about that. I'll impart that to you also. But what's most important before you hear both sides of the story is don't attach to style, okay? Really don't. If you have hair, see what your hair is doing in your life. And I will say a very good example, you know, later about that. So the first is the Buddhist part. If you notice, now, here in this room, everybody has different hairstyle, okay? I have zero hairstyle, which is also a hairstyle without hair, you know, <laughs> okay? Like the number zero is part of math because it's also a number. It's not so funny sometimes, especially in Hungary where they shout all kinds of stuff, you know, after you pass a certain, Krishna, Karate, all kinds of stuff, just because you're bold. If I didn't wear this robe in Hungary, they would take me for a skinhead, and then the gypsies would really give us a hard time, you know? <laughs> Terrible story. <laughs> so that's, that's how much people can be prejudiced about hair or no hair, or what kind of hair. Whether it's curly or long or straight or black or painted or gray, whatever. So in the Buddha's time, social status was really coded in your hairstyle. So the Kshatriyas, the warriors, where the Buddha belonged, had this long hair, you know, completely held together, you know, back here. And uh, they uh, really took good care of their appearance. So when the Buddha left his society or social stratum, the Kshatriya, the warrior realm, the edge of the forest, he cut his hair, it wasn't like cutting bold, and then he let it grow in a different style later in the 
in the forest. There was no hairdresser, there was no sakpal day, there was nothing like in Chinese monasteries later. But he cut his hair, which means I'm out of society. Of course, it, well, it got redefined later as cutting ignorance hair, cutting this kind of hair, that, but the basic reason was I give up the appearance of a warrior because I'm not in warrior class anymore. It's finished. So later on, as this uh, strange religion called Buddhism started to spread, then uh, it became ev evident that uh, it's very good for the hygiene of monasteries as well to cut hair completely. I mean, you spare yourself from so much of a, of a problem that it's not just an indication of social declassification or leaving society, that it's also very hygienic, you know. Just cut it completely and no bugs, no lice, no nothing. Just clean, pure thing. Shining green in the... <laughs> in the moonlight, you know? <laughs> I mean, seriously, look at Jijang Bosa. Jijang Bosa was a monk, and that's why he has this green skull, because he's shaven. It's not some idea that he came from a green planet. No, <laughs> he was a monk, and if you look at, uh, you know, shaven head in a certain, under certain light conditions, it's either turning towards the blue or turning towards the green, depending on what kind of hair you used to have before you chose to cut it, okay? So that's why it's green. He was a monk and he made a vow to go to hell, relieve all beings and come back, etc. So that was the Buddhist part and we, we keep it. We keep it because it's also an indication that, uh, you know, what the hair does to lay people, lay men and lay women, we're not interested in that. What is it that hair does? And I've never heard it so clearly as from one laywoman who came to Huagyasa in the late 90s. And at Huagyasa, uh, we had an option that uh, we could try with the retreat participants, if they wanted to feel like monks and nuns for the duration of the retreat, you could cut your hair, behave like a monk or a nun, basic etiquette, uh, wear completely monks robes except for Kasa Changsam. Uh, but you were expected to follow everything correctly. And you cut your hair. So, this woman was offered this at registration and instinctively, without thinking, she said, no, there's no way I cut my hair, it's my magic. It's there. So, it's not so kind of evident or pronounced in the male behavior, but in the female behavior, very much. Most women, whether they know it or not, consider their hair their magic. The first impression that they give to the rest of the world, or the man that they, you know, want to have a relationship with. So, it's, that's why hairdressers make so much money, you know. And it's just natural, it's, it's correct. Just like men, they, they want to be strong and muscular and that's why, that's how they want to give the correct impression, you know, to women. That's, that's what they think is the, is the first, you know. So, concerning the biblical thing, there is a, a Jewish concept called the Nazir. And that's not a monk, but it's a spiritual practitioner or somebody who devotes his time entirely to the Kabbalah and to the... Uh, they have a holy book, the, the, the Book of Brightness, it's called Shefer HaZohar. And uh, that's uh, containing some practical instructions, but it's not meditation. And one of them is to let the hair grow. But why? I have no idea. What the actual cause is and not some orthodox scriptural thing. I read something about it, but I probably lost all of it because it had no function, it had no real meaning. So they say, let your hair grow. Even in India to the present day, certain Brahmin castes or groups within the Brahmins, or maybe some giants, I'm not so sure and I don't want to offend anybody with my ignorance, but they let their hair grow because it's some holy state or a holy command that you do not you know, cut your hair. One thing that I do know from uh, my studies on the Easter Islands or Rapa Nui,
Easter Islands were very interesting. You know that story with the big statues and all the trees you know, cut out and people gradually disappearing and fighting for possessions and food, etc. So they had a very massive society, but they all degraded. But one thing they had, they had about five tribes over there, and the five chieftains had five young apprentices who swam to a nearby small island and got bird's eggs in their headband. And they swam back and they climbed up on this very steep rock and they brought it before the five chieftains. It was a competition which tribe is the ruler of the island for one year. And next year there was another competition. So what happened was that the chieftain whose apprentice got the egg the fastest and won the competition and thereby the tribe became the ruler of Rapa Nui, that chieftain didn't move from that holy place where they were waiting for the result of the competition. He went to a special, you know, togul right there, a little hut, and didn't cut his nails and didn't cut his hair for a year. And there was an attendant helping him, probably the same guy who won the competition. So there must have been something in these old religions in various parts of the world which uh, probably didn't want to interfere with human nature or God's will, the way your body grows or your mind behaves. Who knows? But it happened in several parts of the earth and in some parts they still keep it. But I honestly don't know the function. I'm so happy to cut it so many times, you know. I can tell you one more story. That's about my hair. Are you interested? Good. That also happened in uh, my late teens. I was, I think, uh, 18 or 19 years old. And uh, at that time, it was almost completely common that uh, people of my age lived together with their parents. It was very difficult to find rentals. There was not so much of a reason to. And if you studied and went to university, if you didn't have some bad karma with your parents, you lived in the same house. So I did. And I had very good karma with my parents. I really, really appreciate what they've done. I love them. It was, it was a very, very good thing that I could be born to them. But my father, of course, you know, tried to educate me. And what happened was he criticized, in my appearance, two things. And this is not kind of simplifying the issue. He criticized the way I dressed, and he criticized the way I had my hair. It was incredible. And Buddhism, or becoming monk, or chulga, or putting on monk's robe and cutting my hair was not even near. I mean, that was like 10 years later. Chulga was 10 years later. Buddhism was just, you know, when I was 24. So what happened, I had big curly hair. Not as big as Bob Marley, but close. Big curly hair. First it was blonde when I was young, then it turned brown. And I didn't comb my hair. I always did like this. And for me that was good enough. So if you started to put a comb into it, it got stuck after two centimeters. It was impossible. And I wore my grandfather's big baggy clothing. It looked like a doormagi, his whole coat, it was so long, and his pants and his shirts. I loved my granddad. He was like my kunsunim, okay? <laughs> he was really wise. All the family loved him, and we, we spent a lot of time together. We, he also lived in the same place, same apartment. So, my dad, every single morning when I went to high school, he checked my hair. Every single week, because we had the same schedule. Can you imagine how disturbing it was? And I said to myself, no, come on, come on. I don't want to get angry. He's my dad. I don't. This is just too much. It's way too much. So what can I do? What can I possibly do? So one day, something flipped over. I was again, 18, around something. And uh, I went to my hairdresser after a uh, pretty strong argument when he said that I'm like from a refugee camp and I look like a clochard, like a homeless, this guy. You get really tired of this kind of stuff. <laughs> and I go to the hairdresser and I say, Etushka, that was her name. Elder woman, 
She used to cut my hair ever since I could walk and had anything to cut on my hair. She knew me from toddler time. And uh, she said, what do you want? She said, Atushka, I want A0 all over my head. A0 is the name of the cartridge that you put on this little zzz, this haircut, which kind of gives you the gosok toro, the complete, smooth, absolute, bold thing. And then she, op she opened her sleeve, put on the A0 and, you know, made a little cut here. And, this, and she had, of course, little hair there and it completely disappeared. And she showed me, is this what you want to do, your beautiful hair? You know, is this what you want? And I said, Atushka, please understand. I had a very, very deep argument with my father. And I want to take away the object of the debate. I don't want this thing anymore. Please, do this favor for me. And she said, oh my God, she really <laughs> wiped some tear in her eyes. <laughs> really. And then she cut my hair, gosoktoro, completely smooth, completely clean, no shaving, so it was like one millimeter was still there. But for the first time in my life, at age 19, in October, I felt the fresh wind on my skull. <laughs> and that was exhilarating. That was really fantastic. And I'm not making this bigger than it was, because soon after that came the cold shower in the kind of family house. I go in, and my mom says, Oh my God, oh my God, you look like a prisoner. Oh my God, what happened? What happened to you? Dad was also home. He already understood right away. And he said, how dare you do this? <laughs> Two completely different reactions. How dare you do this? And I said straight into his face. I was a little bit shaking inside, but you know, I didn't know what was coming next. So I said, Dad, you were arguing with me about my hair. I took away my hair, so I hope that the argument is over. <laughs> he didn't talk to me for two weeks. <laughs> we, we, had, we had greetings, but that was it. He didn't say a single word before I get one centimeter of hair. And he actually knew that it's growing again and I'm not gonna be stupid for him in his eyes to cut it again. I didn't. It really hurt him. He couldn't defend himself. It was a plain fact and he, he could see that this is beyond his control. So he didn't push it anymore. So that was one of my few rebellions. It's related to your question, I believe, because you can do a lot of things with your hair, but it's kind of taking time to fix it, whatever you do, <laughs> okay? It doesn't grow so fast, which is good. So I, I thought just you know, it's kind of uh, as a part of effort to be free from appearance leaking. Well, whatever you do, you have appearance as, as long as you have this body. So zero hair is also an appearance and come on. In the Orient, lay women don't cut their hair. There's no way they would do that. It's a, it's a really rebellious, very strong statement. In the West, you can see it quite a lot. They're tired of their whatever. They go cut it. I've never seen anyone in my 18 years of Korea, off and on, never a single bold lay woman, never. And I don't think I will. Maybe a little blonde these days, they're blonde. I've seen one blue. I mean, something <laughs> happened. Something, rock concert or some Western influence. Yeah, one time blue hair. Few blondies few auburn, so changing hair, hair color is now becoming more prevalent, but it's not, not so much necessary. But never no hair, not here. Okay, more questions? Okay, so shout. <laughs> okay, so use it because it's necessary for the camera. It's not amplifying, it's just recording, okay? Go ahead. You suffer a lot from love? Yeah, most of us. Wow. <laughs> it's normal, isn't it, in our life? It's normal, but a little tragic. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, it's indicating that uh, people like me or like everyone here, once we love, we start to want to have the possessive, the persons that we love and the possessive.
suggest in mind that want to have more time with a person you know want to be I'm want to be in the one who he or she keep thinking of me for example um, I can give you a more clear example that there are two uh, men who are very good friends to each other but one person was gay man and the other person was stray man and um, they become they were good friends but gradually the gay man uh, have strong feeling toward the straight man Wow! because the straight man is really cool and attractive but as you know the straight man cannot love the, his gay friend well not in the same way as the gay would want that's, right. that's for sure treat him as friend only has feel have friendship toward him so but um, this gay friends feel suffer a lot because he wants to be more like a possessive mind mm -hmm. like feel jealous oh yeah and the straight man you know have uh, go socializing with his other uh, straight friends, male friends. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's, it's normal. So, uh, so it was very stressful when the gay man revealed his strong feeling toward him. That was quite stress enough to straight guy, but. He, he tried very hard to treat him uh, like the same, you know. Yeah. But, but so what the straight man has to do, because he, he feels quite stressful now, mm -hmm. because his friends become more possessive and become mm -hmm. very jealous. And okay, I understand the question. Well, the straight yeah. man has uh, basically a couple of choices. Yeah. One is to get another gay friend and get them to meet. <laughs> then he's out of the whole loop. You know, it, it really helps because then they can be for each other, they can even marry each other if the country's laws allow, and then happily ever after, goodbye. If it doesn't work and this gay friend is always hanging on him and always bothering him and want to be with him, but the straight man says, Oh, no, no, I'm not that kind of guy. I don't have that kind of feeling or desire. Already told him. Okay, okay. Yeah. Then, says, for tonight you can hold my hand. And then they go together. They go together and the straight man says, I'll lead you to a very good place where you can have a really good time. So, then they go, 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 and they stop before a gay bar. And then the straight man says, okay, you have to let go of my hand. Here's your friends. So they became different. Then he has to find another partner. And this can be done also compassionately. But very, very clearly inside. You're not gay, so don't make love to another man. It's clear. So then have some compassion towards the person to def defuse the possessive behavior. Okay? So this is really important. No matter what kind of orientation someone has, it's not a reason for anybody to be rude or very dualistic or judgmental or in any way, you know, violent. If you're really certain of yourself, if you really know who you are inside in all respects, then this thing won't move your mind, including the straight man's mind. He may need some skills, you know, or to some tools how to make this happen. But these two... I mean, it sounds funny, but this is not a joke. So get another gay guy and have them hooked up and they say, okay, bye-bye, this is it. So it's really important that we follow the way we believe in. And what if there is no attractive, as attractive as a you know, gay guy? Like it's not the straight man's problem. It's not the straight man's problem. He did his best and then said goodbye and that's goodbye. it. Yeah, he, he, has goodbye. he has to say goodbye. Yeah, and they can meet again when the gay guy hooks up in a, with another gay guy so there's no more jealousy, no more possessive behavior, no more wanting. There's nothing wrong with love. 
but love plus I is possessive behavior. Love minus I is compassion, because it's, it's not based on the senses. It's not based on physical touch. It's based on just sharing the same human substance and completely reflecting your mind, feeling your feelings, sometimes even feeling your thoughts. That's compassion. So, if he has that, if the straight man has that, then he's not afraid of being possessed, because it's impossible. He's not that kind of guy. So then he says, okay, you're my friend, but you have to understand, I'm not like you. So I, I, I'll help you get somebody who is like you or get into you, the right environment. So that's it. Isn't that kind of rude? No, of course not. If it's done in the right way, this kind of you know, straight communication is not incorrect and it's not rude. If he makes a judgment out of it, then it's wrong. If he makes good and bad out of being straight or gay, that's wrong. But following what, you know, orientation he has inside, you know, the straight man wants to have a girlfriend and later a wife. Fine. The gay man wants to have a boyfriend and later on maybe a same-sex relationship. The kind of problems in a relationship is really not based on same-sex or heterosexual relation. It's the same kind of problem, except the chemistry is different, the setup is different. But basically, we have the same problems because we have the same I. So, there's not much of a difference in terms of homework, but in terms of lifestyle and orientation, all kinds of stuff, there is a lot of difference and we have to respect that. Okay? That's straight, I really have to look for uh, another gay guy for his friend. If he wants to help, why not? <laughs> why not? He may already know somebody. Well, look, per perhaps you forgive me if I cannot help you with all the details. But I gave you two very good hints. Work with it. Okay? Next question. Yeah. So you want to take away karma. Yeah. So please tell me what is karma. Nowadays, uh, I, I know uh, I have active and uh, made a lot of karmas. Wow. Only nowadays? <laughs> Not before? Not before. Good. So you have very little karma to take away. <laughs> so. If you don't have more, then maybe you can teach me, because I have lifetimes. <laughs> lifetimes of karma to take away. So how come that you didn't have karma before? How were you born? Did you think about that? So if you were born, that means there was some karma before. Otherwise, you're not born into a human body. There's nothing to continue. So if you don't stop at nowadays, Maybe you went through a rough period of, of your life. That's fine. It's not difficult to take a short period of karma away. Maybe you have to say sorry to a few people. Maybe you have to correct a few mistakes. But it's not impossible. But how do you take lifetimes of karma away? So, there's a saying, the 10,000 dharmas return to the one. Where does the one return to? Not mind, not Buddha then what is it? So, we make millions of karma for lifetimes. How do you take all of that away now? Right here, right now. I mean, that's the teaching of Zen. So, when your mind returns to before thinking, 
So that's one moment without karma. No cause, no effect, no life, no death, no good, no bad, no high, no low. No dualistic state of mind at all. So how do you do this without the hit? In fact, how do you make this moment of freedom last? And for that you have to practice. There is no magic here, fortunately, otherwise it would be sold very expensively by Buddhist magicians. We don't have that. But everybody has the potential to wake up. We call that Buddha nature. Everybody can practice. And you can attain this moment, which is originally free from, free from karma, originally free from life and death. And if you practice, and if you practice really single-mindedly and clearly, then time stops to matter. People ask me, short time or long time? I ask, how much time do you have? You have a few thousand years, a few hundred incarnations, a few kalpas. Originally, time doesn't exist. Space, likewise. So if you go above the clouds, it's not necessary to know how many clouds you left behind. If you go beyond time and space, it's not necessary to know how long it takes. It can take a moment, it can take an hour, a day, a year, a lifetime, a kalpa, who cares? As long as the direction is there, you get there. So find this clear and correct foundation. And based on that, you can make correct effort. And if you keep that direction, there's no way you couldn't get there. Why? Because your karma doesn't exist by itself. Your karma is not absolute. Your karma depends on your mind. If your mind is extinguished, in other words, there's no fire of anger, desire, and ignorance anymore. Your karma is also extinguished. It doesn't exist by itself. You make it. So if you don't make it, you don't have it. All we experience is just the reverberations, the roll-on effects of previous karmas. The problem is we react to them. We make new karma based on them. We feel very fresh, you know, when we make something new. Even if it's the worst thing on this earth. But we make it, it's our creation, our possession, our control, our beauty or ugliness, our life and our death. And when we create these karmas, we feel really powerful. It's all illusory. It all goes. But because it's illusory, because it all goes, that's our chance for liberation. If it existed by itself, if it had self-nature, if it was good or bad by itself, there would be no chance that we would attain full and unexcelled enlightenment, the Huak Chol Deo. But we do have that chance, all of us in this room. All of us. We just have to get down to practicing and start correctly, continue correctly, and never finish it. As long as there are sentient beings anywhere in this universe that need the liberating dharma, we're not done. Personally, you can finish your problems very quickly. If you practice well, you have a good teacher, good teaching, good students, you know, together with you. So the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha, the three precious ones are all in place. And you integrate them in your life and you become one with them. And practicing can bring an end to your personal problems relatively quickly, depending on how you do it. It's right next to you, there's the next person. If you don't help them in one way or another, their problems will touch you. Especially because practice brings down your self-defense. That's one of the hard aspects. If you practice and your eye grows thinner and starts to evaporate, you feel vulnerable. And this vulnerability is something we can get used to. And once you are used to it and you're not afraid of it, it stops being vulnerability it remains just openness. How can you hurt empty space? You can't. You can hit the body, but you cannot hit the mind. Okay? If that mind has I, you can hit that. So that's why correct practicing, soon finish personal karma, then you can help other beings. Okay? What was your second question? Do you still remember that? Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> then I answer it. Okay. Well, of course. I mean, you can have similar solutions, but how you integrate kongans in, into your life depends on you and your karma and your eyes. So, many schools have many solutions. Sometimes they are the same for one kongan, sometimes they are different. But the solution itself, which is written maybe on a page after you finish it, is not as important as the mind training that you got during kongan practice. And I mean, if the answers were helping, it would be handed out and you would learn it. You would repeat it like in a good Confucianist school. Repeat, 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 repeat. And then that would help you. No, it doesn't. What helps you is the process of getting the answer. So the process of getting the answer requires, due to the nature of the Kongan, that you put down all your dualistic thinking, dualistic emotions, your ideas, your illusions, and you put down, put down, put down, until your mind becomes clear like space, clear like a mirror, which reflects everything as it is. And then you find the Kongan solution. But then you get the next Kongan and test your mirror again. Because the next Kongan touches your karma in a different way. Puts light at another blind spot. And exposes your homework again. So, whether we call it gradual or sudden, it doesn't matter. But this moment must be clear at all times. Whether with Kongans or without Kongans, it doesn't matter. But in our Chamsun Burgyo and Kanwasan, Kongan training coming from Imje Sunim especially, but al already, you know, Dharma Desa and you know, Henning Sunim, they already had Kongans, but not in the way Imje Sunim worked out. Without him, Imje Sunim, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about Kongans or practice it during our Ango, our 90 day retreat. And I can tell you, without that mind training, the efficiency of the retreats are really low. Because you don't know really what to focus or even if you know how to meditate, you cannot make it function. So the biggest thing is how you put your clear mind into function. How does it start to operate? How do you integrate that with your everyday life? And because of that, Kongan training is supremely important. It's like the bridge between substance, truth, and function. Okay? If you don't attain your substance, you cannot answer the Kongan. If you don't perceive the true meaning of the Kongan, you lose the truth. If you don't know how the Kongan works, how it operates, how it functions, you cannot integrate that into your everyday life. So that's why Kongan is very important. And there's another important aspect to the Kongan training. That it not only brings down your karma, but it really gives you a taste of mind-to-mind -mind connection with the teacher. So it's a very external solution if you just find the answer maybe out of your intellect or experience or whatever it is. But usually there is a completely clear mind-to-mind, ishim jomshim, very important, relationship between teacher and student. And that can help you open your mind even wider. Now, without that mind-to-mind -mind connection, practice is not working. We say Kongan solutions remain external. External. But to really have it from your heart, you really have to connect, not just to the teacher. The teacher is just a sample, the first and largest broadcast you know, of this. But you connect to the teacher and then you see, ah, I can connect to the whole world like this. I not only perceive the teacher who helps me do this, because he can also perceive the student. In fact, it's his or her job to perceive the student very clearly and teach that from that angle, from that perception. But the student realizes as the practice grows more that you can connect to everyone. You can connect to the whole world. And that's the experience of oneness. And as this oneness, this substance, this substantial experience becomes correct perception, it becomes truth. And it becomes correct action, becomes function. So that's why substance, truth and function are all in our Zen training. It's all in our practice. So that's why we say complete. Okay? So it may work differently in everybody's case, but that's not so important. The substance, truth, function, that's important. Okay? 
Very good, everybody. Last question. I know you don't want to be the last, but you still can ask what you want to ask. Yeah. Yeah, uh, very good question. So, uh, we are very lucky because in China, Buddhism and Taoism met. And that's how our Son Bulgyo became completely practical, completely doable, but very high class. Both paths, the Tokyo and the Bulgyo, they are also very high class, Taoism and Buddhism. But the way Indian Buddhism functioned was a little bit more complex due to the nature of Indian culture. But Taoism was very simple. So they combine the two, best of both worlds, and then everything becomes very, very, I would say, practical and clear. So, we have the Tanjon Ho, the Tanjon breathing, and the Tanjon related practice from Taoism. Okay? And, uh, for Taoists, it was the absolute focus point of their practice. They did everything here, and then they went to subtler energy you know, channels, etc., etc. And uh, why we use the Tantian so much? Because it's really the center of your body for the mind and for the energy, which is undifferentiated. In your Tanjon or Muladhara Chakra in Sanskrit is the largest connection to universal energy. We call that universal energy Deigi. All right? And what your body has is Wongi, the original energy that you brought with yourself. Now, what connects the two is Kongi, your breathing, empty energy. So when you practice Tanjon breathing, then your energy and universal energy combine completely combined and your original energy is getting replenished by the universe. That's why if you do Tanjong practice, you become stronger physically and mentally. So what happens? What happens is that in your Tanjong the energy stays still like the clear unmoving lake. If it goes up, it becomes emotions in your heart, speech in your throat, sensory perceptions in your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and thinking in your mind, here. So if this chi, this energy rises too quickly, we call that sanghi. It's very dangerous. It can burn your eyes out. It can burn your brain out. It can do many very happy. Yes, it's very, very intense and very quick. You are really happy to hear this. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So, if you do Tanjong practice correctly, then this chi starts to travel backwards, down in the front part of your body. And then you become not only healthier, many people do Tanjong Ho just for health reasons. It's possible. But it's like using a spaceship to do, you know, shopping on the Tsuyushi Jang, okay? <laughs> With this you can get enlightenment. Why just feel good? You know? You have this immense, you know, vehicle and you do your groceries? Come on! So if you really focus and you return before thinking, then the, this energy practice can completely support that. So with correct breathing, that's why we keep our eyes open during meditation and we look down in a 45 degree or so angle. If you're very tired, you can raise it a little bit. If you drank too much coffee, you can 
kind of lower it a little more so that you zzz, kind of even more honing in, reining the energy. And then, as you meditate, your tanjuan becomes stronger because your eyes are actually reflecting your visual energy. 70% of all your cognition goes here, okay? So, it, it reflects back. And with your breathing, it becomes really powerful, really strong. So, you return to original mind, original energy in this point. And it becomes original light, your mind light. Because it becomes undivided, non-dualistic, clear state of mind. That's why Tanjung practice is so important. That's why you see this Mahamudra everywhere. Everywhere where there's meditation practice. From Theravada to Mahayana, Tibet, Korea, China, Japan, you name it. Indochina, anywhere, Thailand, everywhere where they meditate, they have this. They have this around or on the, on the Tanjon. Okay? So Tanjon practice is like your safeguard. The moment some stress hits you, you can take a Tanjon breath. And immediately the attachment is gone. Immediately you can reflect. Immediately you can diffuse this really harmful effect of too much thinking, too much emotion, something. Like a traffic jam. And that breathing space, that mind space, is a lifesaver. It saves you from the shock or the aftershock of that impulse. Okay? So that's a very, very important part of uh, our awakening practice, that we constantly detach from illusions, we constantly reflect, and for that you need a very strong mirror. A mirror that doesn't break. And if the mirror breaks, you can go crazy, you can go into a permanent shockwave, or for you nearly permanent shockwave. Many things can happen. We call that broken mind, broken consciousness. Because it got overloaded here. Or overloaded here. Or maybe even overloaded here. You know? So all these energy centers, they have a job, emotion job, speech job, thinking job. Or all the senses, they have a job of seeing, smelling, tasting, hearing. How do we clean them? How do we relieve them? Back to Tanjan, back to original point, back to one mind, all of them the same. So that's why I feel very, very grateful and extremely lucky that I could meet the path, meet the teacher, meet the Dharma, and meet the students and my fellow practitioners, monks, nuns and lay people, all of you. So with that, I would like to thank you for your wonderful attention today, your bright eyes and bright presence, and I hope to see you here next week. Thank you very much.